Welcome to Crossroad Connection. We're speaking out for those left unheard. My name is Art Van Waldy, and I'm the host for this episode of Crossroad Connection. And with me today is Craig DeRoche from Prison Fellowship. Welcome, Craig. Good to it's have you here. Great to be with you, Art. Okay. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Well, how you're involved with Prison Fellowship, what led you to that, and yeah, just... Well, Prison Fellowship, I, I think most of the people at Crossroad Connection know that it was founded by Chuck Colson mm -hmm. when he returned from prison to the community after being sentenced in a Watergate-related investigation. And uh, that was coming up on 40 years ago now that he started Prison Fellowship, which, mm -hmm. which grew to be the largest prison ministry in America and through Prison Fellowship International in 120 plus countries uh, in the world. And how I ended up there was, was uh, the same way Chuck got there. I, I was arrested twice uh, <laughs> back in 2010. And um, that was after I was a, a, a pretty high profile person in my career in politics um, at the time and had a lifelong addiction issue that, that I had not uh, dealt mm -hmm. with that led to me being arrested okay. uh, um, led to that coming to a head and when I was speaking once uh, um, I had surrendered in Christ and entered recovery and mm -hmm. had some restoration taking place in my life I was speaking on addiction and public policy and Chuck Colson heard about that and he said that he thought that God could use my experience not only as a government leader mm -hmm. but also my experience in addiction for the benefit of others just as God had used his experience in prison as well as his experience um, working in the Nixon administration for the benefit of others. And uh, that's, that's how I ended up. I, I actually am the senior vice president of public policy and advocacy. So my area is, is actually called Justice Fellowship, but it's our uh, prison fellowship's advocacy uh, um, for the prisoner, for the community, for the victims. Uh, that's the area that I lead. Um, Greg, where did you serve in, uh, in politics? Where, did, where, where were you? Well, I, um, the, most people remember me. If they, if they Googled my name, they would see that I was the Speaker of the House in Michigan. Okay. Um, I was elected Speaker at a very young age. I was uh, 34 years old when I was elected, just turned 34. And uh, that was back in 2004, so uh, 11 mm -hmm. years ago. And um, was put in charge of, of Michigan's budget, working with Governor Granholm then at the time and um, leading the caucus, my peers um, elected me unanimously to be uh, the, the legislative leader. And I also served on a city council before that, but um, that was my ho highest profile uh, political post. Okay. Talk to us a bit about um, the word broken. What, how, how did that happen and what, what did God do in your life there? Well, the way I like to say this is God loved me enough to take away everything. Hmm every single thing in my life, uh, whether it was my marriage, uh, my ability to earn an income, not just the job, but my ability to earn mm. an income. Um, uh, friends, you know, the network there, uh, the mm. reputation that I had traded on for 20 years, whether it was in sales or in politics, um, and, and uh, 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 really kind of blocked me off from anything but um, God. And, and um, that's where I know that there was love involved, that it was a perfect amount of brokenness for me to surrender, not a little bit, you know, to dip a toe in the water, but to, to go all in, surrender completely, because I had no uh, path available to me, whether it be family or income or um, living as I did before without, without God's help. What did, what did God teach you in that time? What is there, do you remember anything specifically, like what he taught you as you're going through that? The, the first thing God taught me, and, and this has reverberated um, at different intervals since, but um, when I say I was broke and, I, and lost everything, I mean, I, it was everything. I couldn't even stay at the uh, rehabilitation clinic uh, hospital um, because I, w I showed up there sober, mm. and that disqualified me from insurance, so I couldn't even get help from the hospital. And... Um, when I prayed my surrender prayer to God, the first thing was the hospital coming to me, the administrator, and saying, we're actually a Christian hospital. Oh, wow. And we reviewed your case, and uh, we know the insurance is going to deny it, but we think that God has a bigger plan for you and that you're never going to be of use to him or to anybody else if you don't address your addiction first. 
And I remember how powerful those words were, mm -hmm. that God had a bigger plan for me, uh, but I was never going to get to see it if I didn't listen to other people. And that was literally within five minutes of me surrendering to God where an opportunity mm -hmm. in His name came back to me. And uh, that, those were the same words when, when I had started a, to grow my business back quite successfully a year and a half later that Chuck Colson said was he thought that God had a bigger plan mm -hmm. for me than just making money and, and that I should um, um, use my experience for the benefit of others. And so uh, out of brokenness, I think um, for me, it allowed me to understand that those aren't just words, that when people talk about God's plans in each of our lives, it's not just mine, it's mm -hmm. every single person alive on this earth, uh, that they're much bigger than we could imagine mm -hmm. on our own. How does that help you in your ministry with Prison Fellowship and as you come in contact with, I'm, I'm sure you're coming in contact with those who are incarcerated. How, how does that help you as, as you talk with them, as you interact with them? Um, I still am a very um, self-confident person bordering on arrogant or, or uh, lacking in humility. <laughs> it's something that I work on. And uh, I didn't have... Hmm. Um, an understanding of what humility was until hmm. I was humbled, okay. where that love came from God. And um, when I work with those that are incarcerated, when I see people that are struggling in hmm. addiction, when I see people in poverty or, or broken relationships and marriages uh, um, yearning for something different, I know in my heart and hmm. all that's in me that that's me, that yes. I'm not better yes. than anybody else. And um, that's a real privilege of, of uh, not only the God blessing me with that gift of understanding, which is taking away that arrogance and that, that um, self-confidence in a healthy way, but it, it's also allowed me to serve with people and make the mm. connection that I think needs to be made in this culture where we too often uh, try to rank people. Yes. Uh, even as Christians, we, we want to know what the score is of uh, I'm a better Christian or, or I'm closer to God than the other people when Scripture tells us that's just not true. We, we just don't know that. and We, we have not been given the privilege uh, uh, or the power from God. He has not ceded that to us to judge other folks. That's just amazing for me to hear you say that because that is so true. In ministry uh, and in life, what we have to realize is that I'm on the same plane as you. Before Christ, we are equal. And I'm here to help you, brother. I'm here to help you, sister, as we grow together. And sometimes that's a hard lesson to learn. <laughs> and it cost me everything, but it was a good everything. It, it, I have much more now, things that actually matter, okay. to learn that lesson. Um, you've written a book about this recently, correct? Yes, yes. Um, it's called Highly Functional, uh, A Collision of Addiction, Justice, and Grace. And it tells this story of... of um, coming from where the world would call a high place, not knowing, no one knew of my addiction, uh, even when I was speaker, mm -hmm. to um, losing everything completely, to what that restoration in Christ looks like, feels like, mm -hmm. how the Spirit works. It's a very gritty, authentic book. Uh, there's not any swear words or sex in it, but uh, people do have a hard time reading it. it it's very authentic, um, and um, it tells uh, a, a very... Uh, difficult story of what addiction is uh, both in myself and in my family um, as well as uh, the others that I encountered um, along the way and uh, Mark Batterson who wrote The Circle Maker um, mm -hmm. actually wrote the cover um, uh, for it talking about how uh, uh, the power of Christ and, and his spirit being evident and that's what I wrote the book for so I, I would hope that that people would um, you know take a look at mm -hmm. it. Um you said that it's, it's real, it's, uh, it's gritty. Um, isn't that what people want to hear today? Yeah, well, I, I, I think so. Um, I, I think that um, one of the reasons why I can be of use to people that are in prison now or that are struggling in addiction is because I uh, know where they are because I've been there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that means that it's authentic talk. I, my, my pastor jokes and says, nothing will flee faster than the speed of light than somebody who's under in the clutches of Satan hearing mm -hmm. the King James Version uh, of the Bible thrown at them in scriptural phrases. What I think what people want is um, scripture lived, <laughs> you know, in the example of 
you know, I don't have to do that anymore. I did what you're doing. I don't have to do that anymore. So they can ask how, mm -hmm. how. And then um, we can teach the scripture in an authentic way of, of how my marriage was healed. It's better mm -hmm. than it ever was. Uh, but, but that took steps and that, that took conflict. And, and, and so you have to describe that to somebody so you can pass on the gift of, of God's healing and his path and, and what uh, Jesus and, and the others in the Bible uh, taught us in scripture as a truth. And as Christians, what we believe is that God lives in us through the Holy Spirit. That's, that's incarnational. He's, he's in us. Amen. And if He's in us, we're going to be real. We're going to be authentic. And we're going to let Him do the work that needs to be done. Amen, brother. Okay. Well, this has been wonderful talking with you. We need to go to break here for a few moments, but when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about a trip you recently took to Germany and some interesting insights uh, for us to learn. We'll be back here in a few moments, and thanks for listening to this episode of Crossroad Connection. At Crossroad Bible Institute, we are committed to helping people in prison develop relationships with Jesus Christ. By correcting Bible study lessons and writing letters of encouragement, CBI instructors participate in this ministry in a safe and secure way. For more information or to sign up to become a CBI instructor, please visit us at cbi.fm on the web. Welcome back to this episode of Crossroad Connection. and We have the joy today of having Craig DeRoche with us from Prison Fellowship. And we're going to talk a bit about a trip that he recently took to Germany and some of the insights that he saw as he was in Germany about their prison system and especially about restorative justice and the quality of human life and things that you saw, what was going on in Germany. So can you talk to us about that? I, I'd love to, Art. And um, what I'd want your, your viewers at Crossroad Connection to know is that these are not small issues. They're not just the practical issue of uh, how many people are in prison or whether or not they go back to crime. What are mm -hmm. the statistics of success or failure? Um, as Christians, I believe that we need to, to look at these issues with the same passion that we do in the, the, the uh, pro-life movement for mm -hmm. the unborn child. Yep. Because as we know, many of those unborn children uh, the, the mother might be using drugs, might be living in poverty, might not have uh, uh, prospects mm -hmm. of, of a job, and yet we fight for the life of that person created in the image of God. Yes. But when somebody is born mm -hmm. and they come of age and they uh, make a poor choice from, from the small mm -hmm. choice of, of something that doesn't seem to affect other people like possessing a drug mm -hmm. or to a, a, a murderous, violent choice, mm -hmm. um, we too easily say, well, they're, they're not a person anymore. Their, their value is, is beneath ours is at a human level. And we don't have an investment as Christians whether or not that person succeeds or fail, fails. And um, so it is a life issue. And when somebody fails, when they make the bad choice, what they do, as Christians, Jesus died on the cross for us mm -hmm. to provide a pathway for that person to be whole again mm -hmm. on this earth before they return to heaven because none of us will get there on our own. Mm -hmm. We'll all come up short. Mm -hmm. Amen. So to say that somebody else is coming up more short than me, and so that gives me comfort to write them off, mm -hmm. well, Jesus has said that is the viewpoint that will lead us to him saying, I didn't know you. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you um, when, when, when it becomes our time. And so it really is an engagement uh, difference when the way that Germans, which is quite ironic because this trip was mostly in East German uh, uh, prisons which were um, devoid of uh, faith at all uh, wow. for a period of time. And they have elevated the, the value of life and human dignity to a constitutional level, not just statutory level, that uh, uh, people, every human being uh, um, requires the same amount of human uh, value and, and dignity whether they're in prison or not. And that was just stunning for me as a Christian, as somebody who's been a government leader, mm -hmm. to go into a former communist bloc country not that long ago in my lifetime yeah. and see that they've embraced something in a country that was founded in our founding documents that said our rights come from the hand of mm -hmm. God and that we are going to create our country as an experiment where we put God first before the government and we're not doing... Um, 
these very important things when it comes to human life that, that um, a country so new, uh, um, what is it, uh, about 25, uh, 19, 26 years ago. 1989, the wall came down. And, and, um, yeah. that, that they're actually um, uh, providing an opportunity that uh, allows their prison system to be closer to Christian values. It's a government system, but you'd say evaluate that system versus the American system and you're standing on the side as a Christian just saying, which one's closer to your values? It's, it, it was really weird to say the German one is closer to my so values. So what did you see? What was, so you say it's, a, it's, it's in the Constitution that every life matters right. uh, in Germany. So how, how did that translate into the prison system? The translation, the, the most dramatic thing that the prison system says when we went in, and this is if we're talking to the administrators, the lower level employees, the prisoners themselves. The uh, prison says, we are not the victims of the crime. Mm. The victims of the crime uh, get their um, re uh, rest retribution, their restitution, and their rights through the court system, the prosecutors, and the police. We are here to have you pay your penance and to uh, transform to somebody that's not going to do it anymore. So the, they don't harbor a uh, punitive attitude while you're in prison you're not supposed to be punished you're not supposed to be degraded you're supposed to be built up to a person that doesn't live that way anymore that pays back uh, your debt and so on um, the staff there as you hear in american prisons all too often of of um whether it's sex or drugs or or violence or dehumanizing treatment in solitary confinement all of these things it would be completely alien to them they would say wait our job is to keep the community safe when these people leave why would we treat another human being that way? It was a, that was the first thing walking in the door. Uh, so did you experience? Do they have things like solitary confinement and those types of things in their prisons? Or solitary confinement is necessary um, universally. Yeah. It's necessary yeah. in my family. Okay. <laughs> you know, with my young kids. Time out. Uh, um, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, but that's the way they look at it. Is uh, you're having an acute mm. uh, reaction for anger, fear you know, uh, some sort of a mental disturbance. We're going to deal with that now, but it only has to be dealt with while it's in that phase. So it could be hours. It, mm -hmm. it might take a day or two, but, but they really don't see a, a reason other than a severe mental illness, which would not be fixed by incarceration, why somebody would have to spend an extended time okay. away from other people. So how else did you see this restorative model being worked out in the prisons in Germany? Um, another just a, a very um, uh, um, remarkable difference from the American system is uh, we take somebody that's done something wrong, that's convicted of a crime, and we put them in an incarceration um, uh, situation. First of all, at Prison Fellowship we say there's three things that we're worried about. The proportional punishment. Mm -hmm. We've gotten away from that in America. We uh, um, say that what we're going to over punish people for using drugs, 10 or 15 year mandatory minimum sentence to teach other people a lesson. Well, it, it doesn't teach anybody else a lesson. It's an injustice. Mm -hmm. People should be given to the proportion they broke the law, their sentence. The second is the constructive culture, mm -hmm. which I've just addressed in, in Germany. They say our culture inside the prison should move you toward becoming a citizen mm -hmm. in, in, in a way from your old life. In America, we, we have a, uh, 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 a uh, culture that moves people um, further away from where we would have them in the community, further away from living their life away from crime. And then um, the third is closure, mm -hmm. right? And, we, and that's a Christian value, that's an American value, mm -hmm. that's a human value. You do something wrong, go back to my lesson with the kids, you broke this, what, mm -hmm. what atones for that? Once that atonement is done, you can move forward with your life. In America, we do not have that on seemingly any level. You, you, you fall once, it's going to affect your ability to raise your kids, hold a job, get housing, apply for a loan. Um, you cannot pay it back. It's a life sentence. And in Germany, um, uh, remarkably so, uh, most people are in what's called open prisons for the end of their um, sentence where they actually just sleep there. They get up in the morning, they're expected mm -hmm. to hold a job, have dinner with their own family, be involved in their own kids' So they're life. not breaking up the families. They're trying to keep them together. That's right. And, okay. and, but you're going to be accountable to mm -hmm. us. We're going to drug test you. But when mm -hmm. you come back in at night, there's, there's uh, deadlines. You're going to prove as you're paying your penance, you're, we're going to transition you for a period of years mm -hmm. even 
um, away from that lifestyle into performing like a citizen of the country. So we're going to restore the community and we're going to respect the victims because the most respectful thing we can do to the victim is that person will never do that crime again. Mm -hmm. And we're going to respect the victims, we're going to make the community safer, and that person will leave with the confidence knowing that their case is closed, they're welcome back mm -hmm. in society, and they can contribute. And, and we know people uh, in our Christian experience time and again mm -hmm. in our own congregations, the best part about them is what they did wrong 5, 10, 30 years mm -hmm. ago that led them to Christ so they can give that back just as our uh, um, uh, writers in the Bible like Paul did mm -hmm. to say I was this God restored me and and, and I can mm -hmm. be of use to God in bringing you on the same path and, and we can actually um, replicate that and that's what we try to do at Prison Fellowship. Now when you were in Germany talk to us about um, the success of their program. Were they, did they give you statistics at all how it is going for them uh, anything about their uh, their prison population? Is it as large as ours is in the United States? Did you did you get to any of that with them? It's, it's nowhere near as large. The American uh, prison experiment is what I'll call it because our founders called called our whole government an experiment is uh, beyond any incarceration experiment in the history of humankind. We incarcerate more people than Stalin, Mao, and Hitler did in their totalitarian go governments. Um, our uh, uh, incarceration of minorities it, it goes beyond anything mm -hmm. that any of, of a country in human history did to oppress their minorities. But even our Caucasian white population in America is incarcerated at the same level as a percentage of population that the black population of South Africa was incarcerated under apartheid. Oh, that's so a... that's how much we oppress each other. In, in, in Michigan today, there's about one in 34 adults in Michigan under correctional control for probation, parole, or um, incarcerated as we talk. Mm -hmm. um, in Georgia, that was one in 12 adults uh, just a couple of years ago. It, it's off the, the charts. So th they are nowhere near this uh, mm -hmm. um, I as far as how many people are involved in the system. But uh, to give you an idea of that restorative program where people that are watching the show would say, well, how does the open prison work? that requires trust and these people haven't completed their sentence and they get to come back and have a job what does that look like um, one prison that we visited had 270,000 people leave and come back instances in in the year so one person would have you know 200 or more right themselves so but that was 270,000 for the prison instances of people that left um, during the day they had seven violations and um, they were uh, two of them were for uh, drinking from the same person and five of them were just people that missed the time because even being there at 9.01 p.m. instead of 9 is a violation so 200,000 incidents um, and only seven violations um, in that mm -hmm. population you look at the American system with 30, 40, 50 percent recidivism rate where a new crime mm -hmm. actually occurs and you can see that this is actually a pathway to leading people away from crime by restoring the community with a different behavior and, and a different opportunity by treating somebody mm -hmm. as, as a person that can pay back their debt and can be treated like a human being. Well, I think our listeners will realize that um, many of us understand that our system in the United States, it's broken. Um, the way we incarcerate, how we try to rehabilitate, um, it's broken. When we come to election cycles, um, getting tough on crime always sells. You, we hear the politicians, they, they tend to go that direction. Um, but I want our listeners to hear from you. What can they do, um, especially now as we're entering an election cycle again, what can they do? Um, also, what can they do in their personal lives as they are involved with prison ministry to help bring about this restoration process? How can they help bring about this change? I think it's important. Um, it's not politics to me. Um, I think that as Christians we can advocate, mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, Crossroads Bible does a great job of this and get involved there. Um, I think that organizations like like ours at Prison Fellowship that have an advocacy area, mm -hmm. um, and, and what we need to do is we need to advocate for our values. We call it restorative justice, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people that are listening would say, "What does that actually mean? What does it look like?" You could read books on it. 
but you can come to um, justicefellowship.org and you can look at a picture of a house. And, and the house is, is what we call the living temple, that, mm -hmm. that Christ said, you're the, building the temple. And it's the values for the person that's caused the harm, the, the offender, the person that has been harmed, the victim, and the values of the community in restoring that tear in the fabric when a, when a crime occurs, how to actually restore that instance, but also put us on a path where we don't have the, the crime problems. Because after all, the crime, for the person committing the crime, it's not their problem. Mm -hmm. It's their solution to their problem. Mm -hmm. And we know that Christ is the real solution to the problem in that we can turn to alcohol, we can turn to crime, we can turn to sex, but none of those will fill us up like Christ. And so we need to take our voice to the criminal justice system so the real solution mm -hmm. is heard and, and, and available for people that are, are in that system uh, when they're experiencing the brokenness. Well, I often say when you see someone doing something wrong, it's, it's symptomatic that there's something going on here. They're, they're not being filled here with who Christ is, right. um, with God, what God wants them to be. And for us as Christians, we have to help people understand who God has called them to be, who God wants them to become, how he's calling them to be a new daughter, a new son. And when they understand that, they're going to walk away from this way of life that was leading them astray. And that's what you discovered in your life. And that's what I discovered in my life, and I discovered, and I hope your listeners know this too, that God may very well want, as uncomfortable as it is for you, mm -hmm. that that divorce that you had, that problem you had with drinking alcohol, you know, that, that uh, job that you lost because you were dishonest, might be where God wants you to talk to other people that are going through that today. Mm -hmm. Because God was your solution, you found that, and you don't have to be embarrassed about who you were or what you did use that to help somebody who's living that today uh, attract them uh, uh, for the Lord mm -hmm. uh, with what you are today is a different person than the one that did those things in the past. So I, I also try to encourage people. That's why I wrote the book. Yep. My wife it took her a while to understand that, but she, she is fully supportive mm -hmm. of it that this is not something we need to be embarrassed about. This is uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, glorify God's name and, and demonstrate his power mm -hmm. uh, in our lives. Well, I often say to people, what, what I love about God's grace is this. God's in the business of taking the manure of our lives. And he just takes, he takes that junk, he takes that manure. And through the power of his grace, he transforms it so that it smells like roses. That's right. And he uses that in other people's lives to help bring transformation to them. That's right. Okay. The fertilizer. <laughs> That's right. You got it. Well, Craig, thank you for being with us. Thank this you. This has been a joy to have you here on Crossroad Connection. Uh, I pray for God's blessing upon you and your ministry at Prison Fellowship. Uh, I also pray that God will use your book to impact people's lives. And um, again, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And thank you to all of you who have listened to this episode of Crossroad Connection. And until next time, may you experience God's rich blessings in your lives.